All right. Um, you want to get started, Mark? Yeah, so let's um, just introduce ourselves here. So I'm Laura Casaragola. I'm a school gardens coordinator with Grow NYC. Yes, and I'm Chantal Kemp. I'm also a garden coordinator with Grow NYC and I'm gonna be facilitating you guys out. Uh, we also have Jinky, um, who is going to be here helping us along, as well as Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm a nutrition education coordinator, and I will be monitoring your questions. And I'm Jinky, and I'll be sharing my screen for the slides. And welcome, everybody. And so as we go through the presentation, um, we're gonna save time at the end for Q&A. So put all of your Q&A, anything, any questions you wanna ask, put it in the Q&A function down at the bottom of your toolbar. So you can still use the chat to talk and have comments and things, but if you want your questions answered, make sure they go in the Q&A. Okay. And with that, let's get started. Awesome. Let's slide. So this is the food justice overview of the food justice uh, curriculum that we created at Grow NYC. And I'm going to talk to you about what food justice is and how you could teach it. Next slide. Awesome. So this is me. Um, my name is Chantel Kemp. I'm a garden coordinator here at Grow NYC. Um, I got my starts through AmeriCorps working, uh, doing service in NYCHA communities. And from there, I went on to steward in other spaces, uh, Red Hook Farms, and um, was really able to like meet like really like amazing people and kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And it kind of fell into like loving on the earth and being part of community. And that's where like this food justice kind of comes into play. And so I'm really hoping to teach you all about food and our relationship to food and like how that connects to community and like how it connects to everything else as well. Next slide. Uh, so in this workshop, we're gonna talk a little bit about community agreements. Um, we're gonna find our why for food justice. We're going to explore elements of the food justice curriculum. Um, there are gonna be some facilitation guides and some de-escalation tips that are happening. And then we're gonna check ourselves with this cool activity. And then I'll answer, me, Laura, will answer all your questions um, at the end. So let's slide right into community agreements. And so these are some community agreements that I've created for this particular session. Um, and so the beautiful thing about community agreements is that we can always add to them. Um, we can always amend them. Um, and we can really like make it like integrated as part of the space. And so these are some of the things that I think are really important. Uh, the first one is respect comes first, you know, making sure that you're being respectful in the way that you're saying things, the, your mannerisms. Um, the second one, one mic. So, you know, one person speaking at one time and like really listening to that person, really listening to what they have to say. The third one is to honor intentions and to acknowledge impact. And so this one, this creates a more of a relationship between us um, because, you know, if you say something that might offend me, I'm going to honor the fact that you might not have meant it that way. And then your job is to acknowledge the fact that it impacted me in whatever way that it impacted. So that way, you know, even when there's some tension, we're still like, okay, I know you're coming from a good place. This is how it landed for me, right? So that's kind of where that one comes in. And I hope that we're all gonna be like honoring and acknowledging tonight and like, <laughs> that's gonna be really amazing. Um, the fourth one is brave space. And so it's a brave space because we can't always have a safe space, you know, it's the internet, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> there are things happening, it's a pandemic, everything is not gonna be safe and comfy for us, right? And so in situations where you know, something uncomfortable is happening or we're having a really deep talk or there's dialogue about a situation. We need to be brave and be able to kind of speak up and talk about some of the things that are on our minds. Um, and we need to also, you know, be brave enough to know, okay, someone is gonna, somebody might, might agree with me and someone might have my back, um, right? Like honoring the, the intentions of the space that we're gonna like actually like be here for one, one another. And so that's kind of like where, brave space comes from. 
And then the last one is take space and make space. So like as one of the facilitators, I'm taking up a lot of space right now, right? Um, and so in a like in a normal setting, <laughs> it would be a situation where, you know, I might just leave it open to the group. And if you see that you're a particular person that talks a lot or is like always kind of the one that's kind of leading stuff, maybe take a step back and make space for others to be able to share and even encourage others like, hey, you know, I saw you thinking something. Did you have something to say? Do you have something to share? Um, making sure that you're making space for others. Um, and I do wanna leave like a little second here where people can drop some other community agreements in the chat um, that maybe you've used in your facilitation style or something that just came up for you kind of like while I was talking. Um, slide to the I know we have some teachers and I, I bet a lot of <laughs> other types of educators in many capacities joining us today. So if you have any um, things you'd like to add that help foster great community discussions and um, culture, we'd love to hear your suggestions in the chat. Someone's writing, DK is saying, listen to receive, not to retaliate. Yes, I love that. I love that. And I like the, the emphasis, like, usually it's like, listen to, like, don't listen to respond. And I like how you're like, don't retaliate, like, don't try to use it um, as like a weapon, right? Because words can be weaponized, right? I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Z. Um, so let's move forward into the presentation. And, and throughout this whole thing, if something happens, um, we'll make sure we'll, we'll go back and check back in with our um, community agreements. And so why are we here, right? It's not because you guys want to see me at four o'clock, right? <laughs> right. So we're here because we want to talk about food justice, right? And so food is a human right. We need food to survive. We need it to thrive in society. We need it to feel good. We need it to feel connected to somebody. We need it because we want it, because it tastes good, right? And so in our society, food is actually seen like as a privilege. And so people who are worthy, they're worthy enough to eat. And everyone else is kind of regulated to kind of like a caste system. And so what food as a human right does is it basically says that all systems or any system that would use food as a weapon, that would food, use food as a deterrent, that would use food to you know, hurt or belittle others is a system that we need to advocate against and is a system that is systemically violent and racist and oppressive. And so food as a human right can actually help change and shape narratives. And it actually can help lift a lot of stigmas around a lot of students who are dealing with food insecurity and don't really know how to discuss the fact that they didn't have enough to eat today, right? That's not something that there's no kind of conversation starter, like, oh, like, I mean, there is like, oh, did you eat this morning? But the prerequisite is to say yes, or the prerequisite to say, well, I don't really eat breakfast. So that's not something that I'm interested in, right? Because you, we still have ego, even though food is a human right. And so like the power of food justice is that it allows the collective to come together, the collective uh, energy, collective guidance, um, to help overcome obstacles that are related to food justice and food injustice. And so what is food justice, right? Because food justice has a lot of different topics and it covers a lot of different ranges. And let's just slide over to the next slide. Um, and so in food justice, it kind of encompasses a whole lot of stuff. It talks about transportation, so like, Who's the one that's bringing the food and how far does it take to get to us? It talks about food access. So who's actually eating the food? You know, who's it available to? How, how accessible is it to them? Food quality, like, is it good? Am I gonna like it? Is it gonna spoil like after like five minutes, right? Of me bringing it home. Um, cultural relevance, like, does this connect to me? Does this connect to my family? Does this connect to like my identity of who I say I am when I'm eating? 
um, how much money you have or the lack of money you have, because that's closely tied to these other components, right? Like food access and food quality and cultural relevance. So when you only have a little bit of money, it's like sometimes you have to sacrifice one or the other. And a lot of us are actually sacrificing a lot for a little bit. And then the other component is job treatment. And so this is a part that we don't usually see because consumerism, right? We're out, we're buying food, we're enjoying what the merriness that's going on, right? And so we don't really equate um, job treatment all the time with food justice, but it actually does, it actually does affect us in a large way because we need to be making sure that the systems that we're that are in place are positively impacting people and the people who are actually growing food for us and selling food and food distributors and like that they're taken care of as well because if not then like where are we going to get the food from who's going <laughs> to who's going to do the thing right <laughs> and so like as you kind of learn more about food justice you realize that there is not actually like one specific definition for food justice there are actually a million different different definitions for food justice and i'm sure you guys have come up with your own definition of what you think food justice is and so you know in the curriculum you kind of build out a bigger definition of what food justice is and like in the next slide we have a definition that i'm going to share with you guys So the definition that I brought to you all today um, is food justice, is being able to eat food that positively affects your quality of life, your health, and your happiness. And so obviously there are a lot of different components um, that I could add into this. I could add advocacy, I could add food equity, I could add, you know, food justice is, you know, liking what I eat. Food justice is, you know, not having to worry about how much I'm eating or not have to actually like hoard food or, you know what I mean, buy stuff that I know is not going to go bad. So that way I can have access to food over a long period of time. And so like this definition is just to give you guys an idea of, you know, what is food justice and why are we, why is it important? Why are we talking about it? And now we're going to go into a synopsis more so of the curriculum. Yeah, so I, I love the introduction and seeing, um, you know, all those little bubbles of what is food justice and how the definition can be as expansive or as specific as it makes sense um, in, in your context, in your classroom, in your garden, or wherever you're wanting to engage in, in conversations and actions around food justice. Um, but yeah, it is a lot that we, we wanted to talk about. And I remember when Chantel was first starting out last year, putting together this curriculum, we were just like, there's so many things that we can talk about. There's so many entry points um, and there's so many ways to engage people in this. So we'll go into the next slide and kind of try to walk you through the format of the food justice curriculum um, and the components that are in each lesson. So um, each lesson, there are eight lessons total, and each of them has a different focus, but they all have these components to them where we start off kind of settling in using um, intentions. And so that is to create a space that's respectful and open to dialogue um, and building community and culture within your group. And so that was kind of, you got a little example of what that is when Chantel started off today's workshop with the community agreements and asking for your feedback as well. So that's one way to start with intentions and kind of center the group together to be ready to talk about. Sometimes these topics are very heavy and very personal. Um, then it goes into the main idea. And so that's where they'll introduce each lesson will have um, a, a main idea that it'll be centered around. And so that's when we'll go into things like um, vocabulary and we'll put some definitions on there uh, in the lesson that the students can engage with. Then we have um, questions because we do want to be actively asking for feedback and thoughts from the students instead of just teaching people something. Um, these lessons are meant to be a very organic back and forth conversational style where people can really share their knowledges, whether they are in the position of the teacher or the student. We want those roles to be flexible. 
So that's why we have the questions to really make sure that we're engaging um, everyone in the room. The lessons also have check-ins um, because as we said, these topics can certainly get, get heavy um, and can feel kind of intense sometimes. So we just wanna continually check in with the group and make sure that um, you know, if anything is really stirring up for someone that they feel able to share that and then resolve it there in the moment or at least feel that they're being heard. So we do have check-ins built into the lessons. We also have activities and um, these are great because uh, this is where students can feel more empowered to actually be doing, doing food justice even outside of the classroom or the garden or this, or this one conversation that you're having with them and during this lesson. There are activities that actually relate to the real world. And you'll notice a lot of our examples and activities are kind of um, connected to New York City because we're Grow NYC and that's how we developed this curriculum. But the activities can work, you know, no matter where you are and you can adapt them to your own um, settings. There are also videos because it's, videos are fun and very engaging. And that kind of helps expand a lot of the ideas as well, because these videos a lot, um, I know one of, one of the, my favorite ones was like a song about food justice that high schoolers made and posted on YouTube. And so it's really cool to like, see what other people are out there creating and how they're engaging in the topics. Um, getting towards the end of the lessons, we have um, definitions, vocabulary, and this helps build a shared foundation of knowledge so that everyone in the group that's learning together um, has a shared language to be able to uh, communicate most effectively with each other. Um, we also have additional resources. So if you have, if you yourself as the educator are really excited to deepen your knowledge, and if you have students who wanna kind of go the extra mile and keep um, learning about stuff, there are so many resources out there that um, went into the making of the food justice curriculum and will help expand your knowledge about it as well. And then we also have post work, which is another opportunity for uh, students to engage outside of the lesson and really incorporate it and integrate it more into their daily lives. So we can go into the next slide now um, to do a quick lesson synopsis. We are not gonna have time to like go into depth in all eight lessons of the curriculum, um, but just to give some uh, synopsis of what's gonna, how you travel through this curriculum. So the first lesson um, we address for, like biases and um, give definitions for what is a bias and how do biases and lead to discrimination and how does discrimination lead to food injustice? So we're kind of starting from uh, a very preliminary uh, starting point so that people don't feel um, like they have to come in having you know, knowledge about certain things. So this opens up space to talk about racial bias and how that can lead to discrimination, including food discrimination. And it also introduces the topic of environmental racism. And so we, we want to have all these kinds of definitions in the first lesson, again, to create a foundation to be able to talk about things, as well as give anyone in the room um, opportunities to uh, share their own experiences. Lesson two starts to go into food access issues. We have more related vocabulary um, and it also opens up the opportunity to talk about food insecurity and what that means for different people because that can look a lot of different ways. Um, so we didn't wanna just stop at the term food insecurity. We wanna like dive deep into what that can look like in its many different forms. Lesson three is centered around cultural relevance when it comes to food and food justice and why you can't talk about food justice without talking about cultural relevance. Um, and then we have lesson four has a lot more vocabulary. I believe that's the lesson where we bring up the definitions of um, food desert, but then taking that a step farther into 
um, food apartheid, which is sometimes a definition that came a bit later that is still being um, introduced into food justice conversations. Uh, we are talking about different food landscapes and um, observing, it gives opportunities to observe your relationship to them. So you can learn all these terms like food desert, food swamp, food apartheid, and try to identify the aspects that you see around your city or your town or wherever you are. Okay, we can go to the next lessons. So here in the, that was the first half of the lessons. In the second half of the lessons, it focuses, it starts to shift more towards direct actions. We didn't wanna spend the entire curriculum just learning about food injustice. We wanted to make sure that it was really built in, um, that there were actions and uh, empowering ways that people could engage in it so that they're not just learning about food justice, but have no way to actually bring about that reality and create what they actually need from it. So um, lesson five is where we first introduce food advocacy. And that one is um, a really cool lesson because we introduce a lot of different types of food advocacy because there's not just one way to be doing this type of work. Um, and then we explore a case study of Red Hook Farms, which is in Brooklyn um, and doing a lot of amazing work out there. Um, in lesson six, we go into the food system. So that's where you get kind of the whole chain or the, the circle of how um, things go from farm farming and farm working all the way to the grocery store to the waste and who's dealing with the waste and packaging and all of that kind of stuff and how there's really opportunities for food justice at every single point of the food system. Lesson seven introduces food related diseases. Um, and uh, that's where a lot of the, um, the definitions that we used in terms of bias and uh, environmental racism that comes in a lot again in lesson seven. So that's why it's good we introduced that early on um, and how bias can lead to discrimination and injustice within communities. And then we also introduced the concept of counter marketing um, media and food. And so the different ways that you can really, um, you know, work against certain systems that are not serving you and create something better. And then lesson eight, the final lesson, it reexamines um, the, the first lesson, the terms that we brought into there and the activities we did there. You kind of have the group do the same activity that they did in the first lesson, they do it again in the last lesson to see how their opinions, attitudes, um, and beliefs have changed since lesson one. And so today at the end of our workshop, we're actually gonna put you through one activity from lesson one so that you can get a taste of what it would be like uh, in the classroom. And then we have a final discussion and a project that people can use to uh, engage in however they were inspired throughout the curriculum. Yes, that was a beautiful synopsis, Laura. Um, and I also love the when you were talking about, you know, um, introducing counter marketing and, and how important it was to kind of bring up bias um, at the beginning, because it's like, it really starts with us and like our original feelings about things, right? Like we might think mm -hmm. like, not me, like I'm not biased. And then it's like, <laughs> yes, you are, <laughs> right? So it's like, how can we kind of like check ourselves a little bit like at the gate and then like come in and be like, oh, okay, you know, I'm a little bit more open to, to learning some stuff and, and like setting the students up, but also like setting like community members up and like setting mm -hmm. them up in a way where it's like, you know, we're all learning together. There's no such thing as like a stupid question or a stupid opinion, right? Yeah, and, and these, this entire curriculum is actually encouraging people to re-examine their beliefs and change their minds. Mm -hmm. So it's not like embarrassing to change your mind. It's actually like a good thing. And exactly. I, I, I like that, that aspect of it. And I think yeah. even while you were making this and, you know, we were going through the editing process, my mind was changed about certain things. So mm. it works. 
Beautiful. I love that. Okay, let's let's go to the next slide. <laughs> I love that. So now we're going to talk a little bit about like the facilitation of food justice, which is kind of like the hardest thing. Like I could give you guys as many slides as I want, right? But it's like if you don't feel comfortable actually like teaching it and sitting up and talking about injustice and food apartheid, like if you don't feel comfortable doing that, like how do you kind of do it anyway, right? Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, next slide. So the first thing uh, that I think you should do is to understand the importance and the relevance of the lesson and the activity. And so when I say that, I don't mean like, why is it important in school? Or like, why is it important to you? But like, why is it important in general, right? Like, what are some of these topics that we're gonna be talking about? How could they have, you know, impacted people in a negative way? How could this have kind of shift someone's narrative or someone's frame of thinking when it comes to certain, some of the things that we're talking about, right? And how can you actually apply this to like real world stuff that's going on, right? It's all good and dandy to talk about food apartheid, but how do you actually, you know, help students to be able to navigate when they're living in an area that's considered you know food apartheid or a food desert or a food swamp right how do you get them to that space where it's like okay we're in a food swamp right now how do we navigate this how do i give you some real life tips what's going to make this interesting for you what's going to make this relevant for you right and so that's something that i always try to come in with from the gate before i even talk to the students or anything. I'm just like digesting the material as much as possible. So that way when I'm actually facilitating it, I can make it relevant to them. The other part is to create a space for the acknowledgement of feelings. And so this is actually really important because you don't want to feel like um, your opinion or your point of view is the only one that's being told or being heard, right? You really want the students or the community members that you're facilitating this to, to feel really engaged, um, to feel really comfortable in the space, to really feel like they can actually voice their opinion and share some of the experiences that they've had. Like we've been talking about, this is a very big topic and it could get a little dicey, right? And so we need to make sure that we are creating a space where if somebody starts talking about, hey, you know, I didn't eat this morning, that it's not like, oh, this is not the time to talk about that. Like, you know, like you really make space for that person and really make space for some of the stuff that's really going to come up. And then the last one, and it's, well, not the last one, but the one I have on here is to create, to craft uh, community norms or community agreements that equalizes the facilitators and the participants. And so this is kind of probably, this probably should have been number one because <laughs> that equalizer is gonna change the game. I'm telling you, like, I know there's like a hierarchy. I'm the teacher, I'm this, I have this degree, that's cute. But when you're facilitating food justice, it's like, and especially if you're in a position where you yourself haven't been impacted by food injustice, you really wanna equalize it. You really wanna make it so that way, that the, the students or the participants, they feel like they can freely express themselves without retaliation, without retribution, without being made fun of, without you kind of casually bringing it up the next day. You know what I mean? Like they wanna, you wanna make sure that you are setting a, a fair playing field. And so those community norms, like today, I kind of just kind of gave you guys like, hey, these are the community norms that we're using. But if we were in person, we would probably craft these community norms together. And you all would tell me what's acceptable. And then we would refine it and you know shape it how we want for the specific group. And that's the rules that we would abide by, all of us, including myself as the facilitator. So I think that's an important um, part of facilitating any type of food justice conversation is to really take like ego and hierarchy and like biases and all of these other things that kind of make up like who you are like on like like the like the like the bare like you know pieces of you like that's beautiful 
but you kind of want to bring forth like empathy and understanding and compassion and like listening and engaging like that's a lot more important than like you being the one that's always speaking or you kind of like fishing for a specific answer right so you want to have it where there is this kind of very like open space for the dialogue to shift and change and kind of evolve as you go um yes next slide And so I just talked about being uncomfortable and talking about people who didn't eat, <laughs> you know, that morning and like food apartheid and environmental racism, right? And so that's going to get a little bit sticky. That's not something that is, you know, that's not a happy discussion, right? So how do we actually work through some feelings that might arise and actually de-escalate situations before they get too big? And so one is to kind of breathe it out, right? We take a second, hey, it just got hot. I didn't know, let's breathe it out. If we gotta take a walk, whatever we gotta do, and then we'll come back and regroup. Uh, the second de-escalation tip that I have for you is thorns and roses. I think I got this one from TV, but it's so great. Um, and so you basically, <laughs> so the thorns are basically stuff that you didn't like and the roses are stuff that you loved. And so this is a great reflection piece because it actually provides like this balance of like everything is not all bad, but everything is not all good either. And there's still like that equalizer and people start to lean more towards the stuff that they really liked and it kind of diffuses the situation. The third one, this is for like brave souls, right? I would say <laughs> because this one word exercise actually kind of like boils everything down to like our core feelings. And so you would basically have people write out one word on a piece of paper that describes how they feel and put it in a hat or put it in a bucket and shuffle it around. And then everyone takes out a different paper and then they read out the words one by one. And so, you know, if you are like, okay, let's do this one word exercise. And then you're going around the room and it's like sadness, depression, heartache. You know what I mean? Like that might be a bit, that might be like a bit um, crazy for you. But for me, I would really love that because it would really show me like where the group is at as a whole. And like, how can we actually like address some of these uncomfortable feelings that people are having, especially like if there's a consensus around like how they feel. The fourth one is step back, move forward. And this is actually kind of like an ode to one of our community norms. And so in this step back, move forward facilitation, we actually have a candid discussion about what happened. Like, what was the situation? You know, why did it get that way? Like, you know, what's, what's going on? And then we talk about solutions for moving forward. So it's not all about you know, what happened, we're acknowledging what happened. And now we're talking about, okay, so how can we get you to a space where you feel more comfortable either sharing or we stop or we pause? What's the solution for the day? How can we come up with that together? And then the last one that I have for you today is a reflection. So I love reflections because I feel like they provide a lot of internal support. And so this could look like, you know, a five minute meditation and then us journaling about what actually happened. And so this might be great, especially like if you have like a quiet group where it's like, you know, they're not really gonna say anything. It's like, okay, that just got crazy. I didn't even know you guys could get that loud. Let's, <laughs> let's um, <laughs> do like a five minute meditation and then journal about how we felt. And usually after you journal, I don't know if it's just me, but after I journal, I feel like, I could really talk about what I just wrote about because it's, it's, it's not just like, you. It's not just me. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I feel, I feel heard. I feel accepted. Um, right. And so <laughs> you can really get to kind of analyze yourself. And also journaling is really great because then later you go back to it. You might go back to a previous page. You'd be like, oh, I was wrong. Like I was I don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> you know what I mean? So these are some tips that I have. I'm also open to hearing from you all. If you want to drop like your de-escalation tips that you use in the chat, um, I know a lot of you all are facilitating. Um, so really excited to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. 
And in the next slide, I just have a de-escalation because I don't know if, if someone is upset. If we are, if anyone is feeling hot about what I just said or anything that I just said, I, I would love for you to just take a minute and meditate, close your eyes, inhale, exhale, right? And this is like a great, like simple de-escalation. Um, it, it doesn't have to be this slide. It literally can just be you saying it, right? And so um, this is like a great example of some stuff that you can do. And now we'll actually get into the curriculum. Well, exploring it some more. So let's slide to the next slide. Yes, you're all going to get a taste of what the curriculum will actually feel like. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so all this whole night, we've been talking about dispelling biases and beautiful keywords and stuff like that, right? So what is a bias, right? So a bias is a strong opinion that is not based on experience or logic. This is just how you feel. It, it, it has no merit, like it's just how you feel. And an example is liking math over science, but you never took either class. And so I'm gonna challenge you all to kind of think of any other examples of biases that you might have or biases that you think that other people might have. It can be this simple or it can be big and astronomical, right? Um, and I also really love like this, uh, this cartoon because it's like the heart is like, yo brain, like look over here, like all this good stuff is happening. And the brain is like, no, like I'm gonna focus on this little bad thing here in the corner. And imagine if that little bad thing was like invisible, like it was nothing there. Like, <laughs> and so kind of, that's kind of like how our biases is, right? Um, but biases are really funny. And I'm gonna talk to you about why um, in the next slide. And so there are actually several different kinds of biases. And normally when we talk about biases, it's like, oh, we shouldn't have biases. Nobody should be biased. But in, in all actuality, some biases actually can help us while other biases actually hurt us. And so there is a thing called a favorable bias. So someone uh, looks at you a certain type of way in a favorable manner they are still biased against you, but it is working in your favor. And so that might look like getting a higher grade because your teacher thinks that girls are smarter, right? And I remember when that when that um, tall tale came out, when I was like in second grade and they were like, girls are smarter than boys. And I thought, you know, I was up there. So a boy got a higher grade than me and I had to humble myself. Like, wait, that's not a, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so, you know, that is a form of how it can actually work in your favor. But then, you know, it is unfavorable for the person who is being negatively impacted by this, right? So that boy that's getting a lower grade is being negatively impacted by this bias. And so even though biases can actually work in your favor or against you, because biases are normally based off of dominant culture, they're most likely going to stereotype people and block them from opportunities. So as we're starting to kind of figure out what our biases is, biases are, and also understand how we're using, how our biases are actually being used to create like decisions and put policies in place, we have to actually disprove those biases. So that way we can actually make like the space more equitable for other people. And so we're gonna explore a few more examples of biases. And this is where I'm gonna ask for you all to be a bit more engaging. Um, next slide. And so here are some different types of biases. And so I have shown gender bias and also racial bias. And so I love to show these two biases because I feel like, especially like in American culture, these are the ones that are mostly dominant and affect us on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, well, affect me on a day-to-day. -day. It might affect others on a day-to-day, -day, right? And so with these biases, it's like you, you're so impacted by it on a day-to-day -day that sometimes it kind of like 
kind of rolls off of you or sometimes it's like is like very suffocating and a lot of pressure for you right and so i would love for you guys to kind of write in the chat um about what you think these images are trying to show like what is it that you think that the people feel in these images um are there a specific character that you actually connect with or that you empathize with um is there some intersectionality between these two biases and, and what does that look like? Or even try to put yourself in one of these positions. What if that was you um, that you know was in this situation where you were being affected by a gender or a racial bias? How would that kind of make you feel? How would that um how would that affect you? So I want to give some time um, in the chat or uh, yeah, in the chat for people to kind of talk about how this is making them feel, what they think about these. It's really quiet. So I think people feel really strongly about it. <laughs> what do you think, Laura? We have we could go on to the to the poll check your <laughs> bias activity. That might be easier than having to type out responses. That's um, true. Okay. But I will let you guys know that this this pause, this this pause that we just experienced, you will also experience this pause when you are facilitating food justice. So just being <laughs> Just being okay with that because this right, this is really heavy, right? I just was like, type out a little message about how you feel about gender bias, and you're already, like, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, Laura, let's let's um yeah, let's go straight into the activity. You're right. Next slide, Jinky. Nice. So this is an activity where we actually explore how food insecurity. Um, and food justice efforts are connected to biases, right? And so you'll have a moment to determine whether you think some of these statements that come up are either true or false. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. There are just a variety of opinions and perspectives. And so there are gonna be a poll coming up. can launch them now. Um. So everyone should be able to see the poll now. Um, yeah. Should I read out the questions? Yes, you may. Okay, so the first one, um, these are all true or false. And the tricky part of these is that you're gonna wanna like, they're very nuanced. And so you're gonna wanna like have to answer more. So uh, if we have time, I do wanna leave time for questions um, before 5 p.m., but maybe we could ask people for, um, their, their opinions if they want to raise their hand and answer. But number one, people don't have access to fresh produce because they don't ask for it in their communities. True or false? Number two, if people managed their money effectively, they would be able to afford better food. True or false? Number three, the supermarkets in black and brown communities don't offer quality produce. True or false? And then the fourth one we have up here today, people who use SNAP or EBT, formerly known as food stamps, don't buy healthy food, true or false. And so each of these questions, I actually find it, some of it is just very hard to answer true or false to. Some of them are easy and I think everyone will have a different take on them. And so these are conversation starters where when you have a group of people you can put these bias statements in front of them and they lead to a lot more deeper conversation surrounding the statement. Yes, definitely. I also wanna uplift Tutu in the chat um, who were talking about feeling angry about both images and could see okay. how a black woman would be doubly affected um, with the gender bias and also racial bias. Just wanted yeah. to uplift uplift her. And I love the way these uh, this voting is going down. 
it's it's interesting to watch the poll because the you can see the answers shifting a lot mm -hmm. between true and false and it keeps seesawing back and forth exactly so i'll give everyone just a few more seconds to put in their final answers although they don't have to be final final <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And so for the first do bias, have, do you think we have time for someone to share out, Chantel, or how do you want to do the last one? Yeah, time? I would love for someone to share out um, and talk about why they picked true or false. Um, yeah, me. so in the, um, if you are interested in uh, sharing your responses to the questions in a minute or less, you can raise your hand and we'd love to unmute you and you can explain um, your answers to the questions. We have some people. There are some people who had their hands up like previously right. and I'm not sure if that was. Uh... Oh, we have uh, Evelyn Reed who's from HSPS. I, yeah. Evelyn, I'm gonna allow you to talk and we'd love to hear in a minute. Hear me? Or less, yes, yes. please give us your, give us your take. Um, I just found number three very interesting how we were like almost straight down the middle about the supermarket and back in brown communities not offering quality pro produce. Mm -hmm. I found that one very interesting because it does really depend on which neighborhoods you're in. Some supermarkets do have like a huge produce section and others you only see bodegas with like maybe a few bananas, maybe a few oranges, but mm -hmm. it really does depend on the, on the community in the city and I definitely see it in the poll right here. Mm. Yes, I love that. Um, let's even try to get another person. Great, thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah, I think like that one where we can talk about um, black and brown communities, that one is really to talk about uh, the concept of quality produce and also kind of like to shift the narrative, right? Because I think um, for a lot of folks, they don't actually, they haven't actually been in a supermarket in a black and brown community or predominantly black community. And so they don't actually know what is being offered. They don't actually know about the selection or the quality or whether or not folks even want to eat there, right? And so this is a great conversation starter, um, especially if you're living in a, in a community that is predominantly black or a predominantly white community to kind of open up people's eyes about some of the stuff that's going on. And I think the impulse of having like pushback to making an assumption about mm -hmm. all communities yes. of one type, that's yes. also a really valuable thing to note. And mm -hmm. I think we were expecting people to have a pushback to being able to just, you know, purely classify you know, between communities exactly. like that. So that was a great response, actually. Yes. Um, so should we uh, have one more person share? Yeah. All right. Do you want to pick this one, Chantel? Can you uh, see the chat yeah. or not? I can see it. Um, let me go with Amanda. Amanda, are you there? Okay. If so we can't hear. Yeah, we can move to Pamela. Okay. Let's see. Oh, Pamela put something in the chat, actually. Um, Pamela, I'll allow you to talk if you want to say yours out loud, but you don't have to. Hi there. Um, I've worked in uh in New York City for 26 years doing um, gardening work. And I just noted that it was a hard question to answer because I think that um, in some communities, there are certain kinds of produce that are like wonderful and amazing and fresh and, and delicious. But in, then there's also in that same grocery store, there's other kinds of produce that or maybe not as high quality because they're not, they don't move as much. Mm. And so I thought that was like a really kind of like a, a question that had multiple layers. It did. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate the, the nuance that you brought to it. And that's what we were hoping people would do. 
Exactly. These questions are deceptively and purposely. <laughs> They're like um, meant to be <laughs> confusing. Um, if we have a second, I'll un I'll unmute Amanda, Amanda. Brooks because we were gonna let them talk yes. too, but it didn't Hi. work. So Amanda, you should yes. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um I I they were interesting and especially the black and brown community one. Mm -hmm. because people tend to think that Pete is a monolith and I grew up in a mostly African-American which is very diaspora mixed ethnically mm -hmm. and so if the if the communities tend to be um that people forget that they are a stratosphere of of socioeconomic um incomes mm -hmm. and it's also sometimes we have a very um Anglo-Saxon view of what is is good quality mm -hmm. and it's amazing mm -hmm. to me Funny last year that you know Nostrums was selling collard greens and that's the new kale, which is not. <laughs> you know, that's something you could always find in the community. And the one that has the bias of people who need food assistance as if they're buying, as if you can have extravagant food. It's one thing that they're buying what they need. And also that people who don't have a certain income should only eat certain things like lobsters just for people who have money when that started out as a poor person's food. If you could, if you could eat it. Yep, I love that. Yeah, that's that's an awesome take um, as well. Because that a lot of this, what you just brought up, was you know socioeconomic status. You know, that's something else that we're hoping um, yeah. can be talked about during these conversations too. That was awesome. The, the intersectionality between um, race and and social status, right? And race and classism. Um, and the, and then like how, you know, black and brown can sometimes be kind of put into separate categories if we start talking about ethnicity, right? And now we start talking about the diversity that happened and that's happening between the black and brown communities, right? And how that kind of also is still different in different categories, right? And so I love that. Um, so let's, let's move to the next slide. Um, because I know we're coming up on time, uh, where we kind of just check in a little bit with you all and just make sure uh, that everyone is okay after we have just kind of reviewed this variety of bias statements about food justice, food justice and food injustice. Um, and then regardless of where you kind of sat on that true or false scale, right? There, like we said, there's so much nuance to this. There are so many different perspectives. There are so many different opinions and so many different takes and different layers that we can add to this conversation. And next slide, we're coming up on the end. And so as we kind of wrap up for today, um, some of the things you can do, you can learn more, you can check out the food justice curriculum and teach it. Um, you can volunteer at some of the amazing community gardens and other kind of like social justice, food justice um, organizations. You can um, <clears throat> use your money and your socioeconomic status to actually figure out what is, what is good for your community, right? Um, you can share this, you can be a food advocate for change, or you could do a multitude of other things. You can make a video, you could write a t-shirt that says food justice matters. You can <laughs> do whatever uh, you feel, um, but make it be actionable. And so that way it can actually um, impact others. And now I wanna open it up to questions. So do we have folks writing um, in the Q&A? So we don't have any currently in the Q&A. People can still drop them there though. Okay, awesome. Oh, Emily, you just wrote something um, to the panelists. Would you like to speak about it a little bit? Maybe we could. I can, uh, do you want me to read it out? Yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, so we have a question. Um, this made me wonder if how I, as a Caucasian or white woman from an affluent area, should approach this topic differently than someone who has firsthand experience feeling the impact of food justice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that as a person who 
hasn't necessarily been impacted by food justice. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't facilitate. Um, I think that just being intentional about how you're facilitating and really giving the participants or the students the opportunity to lead the conversation and use their lived experience um, as, as kind of the metrics of where this lands for them, right? And so understanding you don't have that lived experience, but they do, and letting them be the experts um, in the room who are really talking about how this is impacting them and where you kind of could, what solutions we need to like take a step forward. I think that's also where I liked a lot of the facilitation tips about how to equalize the conversation so that it's it's supposed to be, um, uh, you know, a lot of give and take and that everyone in the room has something to offer. Um, that could also, if you feel like you've been, you know, if, if you could talk about the favorable and unfavorable bias and how certain communities, um, perhaps the one that you, you know, grew up from, um, had a favorable favorable bias in terms of in terms of food. So you know there's kind of like a flip side. And so it can be really powerful to have people, you know, who are getting the favorable bias and the unfavorable bias working together to create something that serves everyone. So that could be, you know, an opportunity for conversation on that. Yes, definitely. And I think also, you know, as a Caucasian person, I think something else to note is that you know, just because like food justice impacts a lot of people, not just people of color. There are a lot of people in small towns and in rural areas who are heavily impacted by food injustice and are really in a like a lower caste system. So I think that, you know, we can start talking and breaking apart some of the stereotypes and start really talking about the intersectionality of food injustice and how it really is affecting people. Even, you know, where you came from a very affluent area, I'm sure you probably can think about, you know, maybe an area that was adjacent to you that was like, oh, don't go over there. That's the bad side, right? So it's like, how do we get to the good and the bad side? And how do we kind of explore that in a way that is beneficial for everyone? Yeah, um, I think another we, thing I We have a about, question in, uh, in the Q&A. Nice. Um, do you have any tips on language to use with students that doesn't shame or make them feel bad if they live in an area that is impacted by food apartheid? Um, I think just keeping it real like that. I think, I think, cause I think it's like, they know, they, they are aware that they don't live in the best community um, or things are not, you know, the best, but that's kind of just what it is. Um, I think for shame, shame is gonna come up. Um, shame, guilt, unworthiness, those are feelings that are gonna come up because we are talking about not having, not having access to, um, not knowing if you're going to have access to, and then at the end of the conversation, you have to go back to that thing, right? And so I think, you know, that's where like the acknowledgement comes in and like the real world solutions, right? So it's like, how can I not only talk to you about food apartheid, but then show you how to navigate that situation and, or you show me how to navigate that situation and we come up with actionable solutions together, right? So. I think it can also be powerful to just say really upfront, like this concept come, like there is stigma with it and there's shame where there shouldn't be. So even just naming the feeling and that it's okay to feel that way, but it's not their fault. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, and then the other thing I think was really intentional about the design of this curriculum is that it's not meant to make people at the end feel demoralized and like, oh, the system is terrible. I'm going to be stuck in this forever. Like that, like that's why we have all these examples of look at Red Hook Farms and look at the 15 year olds that are like completely changing the landscape of this entire neighborhood. So we, we, 
I know we added stuff and Chantel was really intentional about putting that in there so that people don't leave feeling demoralized and, and you know, stuck like that. Right, because like the purpose of it is not to be like, oh, like everything is bad, right? It's like, <laughs> no, because like that's not true, right? Even though, you know, it might not be the best, everything is not bad, right? So it's like, how can we actually um, kind of break things down into like manageable pieces and work against some of those things and then really like acknowledge and kind of love up on this stuff that is good and that is popping up um, and that is like that people are really prideful about. And so maybe that's having a question about, you know, what's the best thing in your community? What's the thing that you like the most about living where you live? Um, especially if you know it's going to go into uh, a deeper conversation about food apartheid or food swamps or food deserts. Yeah, and I'll just highlight some, someone just put in the chat to us a good suggestion. You can use language like yet. For example, mm -hmm. your local store doesn't have X thing yet, but what can we do to change that? Okay. I think that's great wording because you have, you know, the possibility of what can be and mm -hmm. also the fact that, you know, we can work together to do this. That's a fact. I mean, I every time I think about like the students and, and how they'll create how they'll react to the curriculum, I always think about like Greta Thunberg and like how like she's like 13 and is like now it's, like, <laughs> she's older now. <laughs> yeah, she's older than that. She's like now 13. she is. <laughs> oh, okay. Well but yes. When she started, right? She was so young and she was able to make such a big impact. And so, you know, it's kind of like you know, don't let the fact that you're young or that you're a student hold you back from what you feel you deserve in your communities. And how can we like come together to really make like a big impact and like real actionable change? Yeah, I will say like students and, you know, and facilitators mental health was definitely taken into account when we put together the curriculum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I love. Um, should we go to the uh, end of the end of the presentation, Jinky, so that we can see the um, yes, kind of finish out? Special thanks to the collaborators here, Bernice um, and our beautiful community partners. Um, and these are amazing, like you know, organizations to check out if you want to keep getting involved as well. Um, and then the last slide is if you would like to send any feedback for this, we'd love to see that. Um, you can find the uh, you can find the food justice um, curriculum. It's for free. It's on grownycdistancelearning.org. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now, but you can we'll send a follow-up email as well so that you'll have this. It's so you can find all all eight lessons there. Yes, and I'm, I'm really excited for your, for your all feedback, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, how it could be better. It was the best ever, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we hope you go out and you use this and you feel, you know, really um, empowered to go out and do this with your students, whomever they may be. Yes, awesome. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, I appreciate you all. Amazing.